I'm at the Kennecott Copper Smelter in Utah. It's at this very facility where engineers and operators rip elemental copper from the living rock. While this process was discovered accidentally, over the untold thousands of years of innovation and experimentation, we've actually got quite good at it. Today, we'll be finding out how to turn something looking like this, through this, into something a bit more like this. You're in for a pretty spectacular episode. In the beginning, copper processing wasn't nearly as complex as it is today. Throughout the Stone Age, this is how you get your copper, in its raw elemental form, in rocks and outcroppings littered throughout the ancient world. It was a nice looking shiny metal, which was easy to hammer into shape without the use of complex tools. Unfortunately, there wasn't all that much of it, meaning that its use was limited to one-off ceremonial items or some quite basic weapons. Copper itself isn't super rare. However, like other metals, it is quite reactive, often bonding with oxygen or sulfur in order to produce other minerals. One such mineral is malachite. It's beautiful, but ultimately quite useless. A bit like pi after rounding it to three. Around 5,000 years ago, a skilled potter discovered that by grinding colored metal ore into powdered dye and then painting it onto their wares before firing it in a heated kiln, they could produce some visually appealing designs. Shortly afterward, an unskilled potter discovered that if they left their painted pots in the kiln for too long at too high a temperature with bad airflow, then they'd produce tiny metallic globules of copper. They'd also ruin all their pots. With metallic copper oil in ready supply and a bit of tweaking to get the process working at scale, we soon had a reliable source of the metal. We found that by adding in tin, we would get a much harder, more workable material known as bronze. The ancient world erupted with new invention. As empires grew, so too did our demand for copper and mastery of its refinement. Ancient Egyptian tombs showcase us producing it on an industrial scale. We had well and truly left the Stone Age and into a new era of empire. Today, our dependence on copper is as strong as it's ever been, hiding at the heart of the modern world. As supplies of high-grade copper have dwindled over the millennia, we've been forced to take copper mining and its refinement to the extreme, which is what brings us back to Utah. Our copper begins at the Brigham Canyon Mine, the largest, deepest, most productive open pit mine that the world has ever seen. The main copper mineral mined here is chalcopyrite. A conveyor carries our jumble of rocks eight kilometers down the mountain to the aptly named Copperton Concentrator. First, we need to break the ore and rock down into even finer particles. This makes it easier for us to, later on, separate it into the stuff that's containing ore and the other bits which are just boring rocks. In the past, you do that by banging the chunks together, although today we're a bit more technologically advanced and use these, known as ball mills. They work similar to ocean waves, where they bring a mixture of the ore and some ball bearings up and then cascade them down, slowly grinding it away. While the ball bearings are significantly harder than the ore, they too suffer a bit of a beating. Here is a bearing as it went in, and this is that same bearing after just two weeks. Got turned into pretty much nothing. In the past, you then have to manually go through this material in order to separate the stuff containing copper from all the rest. However, since that is completely impractical to do at scale, today we use froth flotation. Essentially, bubbles. Our powder, containing roughly 1% copper, along with some bubble-promoting chemicals and a lot of water, are added to the bottom of our tank. A giant whisk agitates the solution and adds in some bubbles. Important to the process is the addition of the long-chain hydrocarbon potassium amylxanthate. One end is extremely copperphilic, meaning that it attaches itself to our copper-containing chalcopyrite, while the other end is extremely hydrophobic, I want to avoid the water, which it does by attaching itself to the inside of one of our bubbles. As these bubbles rise, they bring the chalcopyrite along for the ride. At this point, it's roughly 27% copper. All of that copper mineral containing foam makes its way out here into what is appropriately known as Niagara Falls. From here, it makes its way into three large testing tanks. 
By this point, most of the bubbles have already popped, so our copper mineral is able to sink to the bottom. Excess water spills over the sides, where it's collected to be reused in the facility. The sunken slurry is pushed to the center, where it enters a series of pipes. For almost 30 kilometers, the copper concentrate snakes its way down the mountain range, eventually finishing up at the Kennecott smelter. Here, the slurry gets dried before being loaded into the flash smelting furnace. We start by heating up the copper ore, which breaks apart its delicate lattice structure into copper sulfide, ferric sulfide, and sulfur dioxide gas. In its gas form, sulfur dioxide is actually pretty harmless. However, when it gets in contact with moisture, such as the moisture inside my lungs, it forms deadly sulfurous acid. Fortunately, most of the SO2 gas gets collected as it's produced, eventually being sold to make some industrial acids. However, for the small amount that escapes, I'm going to be wearing this full face respirator to ensure that none of that SO2 gets into my lungs. This electronic gas detector will give me a heads up if SO2 concentrations get too dangerous and I need to get out of the facility. Back inside the flash furnace, a stream of pure oxygen gas reacts with our molten iron and copper sulfide, replacing the sulfur ion with one of oxygen and producing an insane amount of heat. We separate the mixture based on its density, with the less dense iron and rock components at the top, while at the bottom, we have copper oxide. That's the dense bit we need for processing later on. We tap into the furnace to let that copper oxide out. The upper layers known as slag get moved into large buckets, which are unceremoniously dumped outside. Glowing in the cold winter's air, the whole thing reminds me of Mount Doom. Meanwhile, our molten copper oxide, now containing 70% copper by weight, flows to the anode furnace. This is one of the hottest parts of the entire facility required in order to give a bubbling of methane enough energy to rip away that pesky oxygen atom. When the waste products burn off, giving us a nice green flame, we also get 99% pure elemental copper. The molten copper is passed through a series of channels, where it enters an awaiting trough. Once precisely 380 kilograms of the stuff are measured out, it gets poured into an awaiting casting basin. This is located on a turning platform, which eventually cools it down and pass it on to the next stage of the facility. The whole operation from above reminds me of Iron Man's arc reactor. Upon cooling, these slabs are known as copper anodes. For the vast majority of human history, this is the best quality copper which money could buy. You know what's better than 99% pure copper anode? 99.95% .95 pure copper cathode. While this may sound like overkill, it's what's required for today's electrified, copper-driven world. Coincidentally, the way we get to there is by using electricity, in a process known as electrolysis. The anodes are transported to our final facility via a dedicated rail link. Here they're submerged into a copper sulfate solution with thin pure copper cathodes interspersed in an alternating pattern. A voltage is held across adjacent plates, which sucks away electrons from the anode and dumps them onto the cathode. This causes some of the surface copper atoms to enter solution as ions. Meanwhile, the impurities just fall to the bottom as a sort of sludge. Now in solution, our positively charged copper ions are attracted toward the negative plate. When they reach it, they regain these missing electrons to return to solid metallic form. Copper at 99.95% purity. Copper and its refinement aren't just another part of our everyday world, but what allowed that world to come into being. Part accident, part intergenerational scientific endeavor, it's taken us from the Stone Age to the Space Age and even beyond. Until next time, this has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up.